question part of this. I would like to let you know that this is designed to be information in a general information type of a, a setting. I'm, I'm welcome to, I, I welcome all your questions, but I will, will have to refrain from getting into specifics of individual cases because without all the information, I I'm, I'm, don't want to give you poor or inappropriate advice, but I'd be very happy to answer questions about um, congestive heart failure in general. And then after we do the questions, I'm going to invite my wife up here. Um, she's sitting back there in the, with the white sweater to uh, help draw some names for the door prizes. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a pacemaker. Yes, ma'am. And I've often wondered if I were to have a heart attack where someone did not know me and they did the defibrillator, would it affect the pacemaker? The question is, uh, um, this young lady has a pacemaker and she's wondering if she needs to have a shock from paramedics because of a heart attack, will it affect the pacemaker? That, first of all, it is not very frequent that people who have heart attacks require their heart being shot. That's, that's an infrequent occurrence, first of all. Second of all, if you have a heart rhythm problem that requires being shocked from by the by paramedics or in the hospital. We don't worry so much about the pacemaker because we work to get the heart rhythm back to normal. And it may be to your benefit to have the pacemaker because if the heart is shocked and it comes back to a slow rhythm, the pacemaker will actually help pick it up. It is possible that having a defibrillation in the setting of having a pacemaker in place, it can cause some programming changes to the pacemaker, but that's down the, our list of concerns if we're to the point of having to give a shot, okay? And it's easy to reprogram. Yes, ma'am? What causes heart murmurs? Uh, are you born with them, or how do they develop? What causes the question is, what's a heart murmur? A heart murmur is a sound that the physician hears with a stethoscope due to turbulent blood flow through the heart chambers. It's caused by either a narrowed heart valve, or so it's not opening well, or a leaky heart valve that doesn't close well. So that's what a murmur is. Some people can be born with murmurs, and some murmurs can develop because the heart valves may work fine for the first 70 years of your life, and then it starts to, valves wear out just like other parts of the body and just like anything, and then a murmur can occur. But a murmur is a very nondescript uh, terminology. It just means a sound heard with a stethoscope due to turbulent blood flow through the heart. It may mean there's something called a physiologic flow murmur, which is the sound of blood flow through the heart muscle, through the heart chambers normally, or young people can develop valve problems also. So, but when somebody says to me, I've been told I have a murmur, um, I just think, okay, that means somebody heard something, but that doesn't tell me anything else. Yes, sir. Once you start congestive heart failure, can will it progressively get worse or is it possible ever to, for it to go completely away? It's a good question. Congestive heart, the question is, is congestive heart for a, uh, a, a progressive course of deterioration and getting worse or can it stabilize or can it even get better and go away? Um, it depends on the cause of congestive heart failure. There are so many different causes of congestive heart failure. In some instances, it may be a progressive downhill course. With the medicines and devices that we have nowadays, it is impressive how we're able to uh, help people uh, gain stability and be well compensated. Uh, when I started doing cardiology 20 years ago, people that we would have said had a 50% chance of being alive in two years because of weak heart muscle are living now 10, 12, 15 years. So just the advances in one or two decades have been absolutely incredible. Um, some congestive heart failure, uh, some of the reasons for congestive heart failure can be rever reversed, such as doing the bypass or valve surgery. Mm -hmm. If the fluid buildup and the inefficiency of the heart pump is due to the heart muscle being starved for oxygen and blood, and you restore the blood flow by the bypass, and the heart muscle gets stronger, congestive heart failure may no longer be an issue unless the bypass has developed problems. Same thing with a valve. If the problem is due to a valve not allowing the heart to function 
efficiently by uh, improving the valve function by either repairing or replacing the valve. The heart works more efficiently. And you don't have the fluid buildup. Uh, congestive heart failure also can be a uh, temporary thing in response to stresses placed upon the heart in the setting of infection uh, or a heart attack uh, or maybe a situational thing where our people will sit down and have two bowls of homemade chicken noodle soup which has more salt in it than you can shake a stick at and if you avoid those type of situations um, you may not have it come back okay so it, it depends on the, it's a good question, but I can't answer that for you specifically because it, depend, it depends on why it developed the first time. Okay. Next. Oh, yes, ma'am. If uh, someone has a congenital heart murmur, are they then more prone to congestive heart failure? I'm not sure what a congenital heart murmur means. I uh, mean, they had it when they were born. As we said before, heart murmur just refers to some turbulent, a sound of the blood flow being turbulent through the heart chambers. There can be reasons that people have this due to severe valve problems that can get, they can get into trouble early in life because they have, their heart was formed very in, in, inappropriately. Mm -hmm. um, there are many people that have been told they have a murmur and it's that physiologic flow murmur that I told you about, which is just the sound of the blood flow through the heart chambers and that's normal blood flow. One of the things that you'll find is that when individuals are younger, they tend to be less, insul they don't insulate the heart as well as they do when they're older. And as we get older and there's more stuff around the chest, we don't hear the blood flow as well because the heart's better insulated. And um, so a lot of the murmurs that are heard when people are young are benign, not all but a lot. Yes, ma'am. If you have uh, breast cancer and you know you have edema from that and then you come up with congestive heart failure, what are the odds of overcoming the the question is if you have breast cancer and develop leg edema, um, I'm sorry, say that again? In, and arm. In, well, arm, okay, and arm edema. Um, swelling in the ankles, there are many things that cause it. Congestive heart failure is one of them, uh, but that's not the only one. So a lot of things, just because there's are, there are swelling in the ankles doesn't mean that you have congestive heart failure. It may be the reason, but it doesn't have to be the reason. Oftentimes when you have swelling in the upper extremities, uh, well, let me back up, not often, almost always when you have swelling in the upper extremities, it's not due to congestive heart failure. Remember how I said that fluid goes, fluid, their water goes to the lowest point? Well, your arms aren't the lowest point, your legs are. So when there's swelling in an individual, uh, in one arm or both arms, it's usually due to obstruction of the vein, lead, taking the blood away from the arm towards the heart, or obstruction of the lymph nodes or the lymph system to that vest, to, to that um, extremity, to that arm. Um, breast cancer in and of itself would not cause swelling in the ankles. Certain chemotherapies that are used to treat breast cancer can cause weakening of the heart muscle. Oncologists are well aware of this, and they have their patients do echocardiograms, which is a test to look at the heart muscle function with a sound wave at appropriate time intervals to monitor for changes in the heart muscle function. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can cause leg swelling. That doesn't mean you have congestive heart failure. Yes, sir. Is pneumonia uh, a factor in congestive heart failure? The question is, is pneumonia a factor in congestive heart failure? Pneumonia in and of itself is, what, it, what that means is it's a uh, infection in the lung tissue, and that does tend to remove some lung tissue from being able to uh, exchange oxygen, and people can feel short of breath from that. The stress on the body of the pneumonia can lead to congestive heart failure because it's re the pneumonia or the stress of the body of the pneumonia is requiring the heart to pump blood more vigorously throughout the body, and there can be some fluid buildup because the heart's being asked to do more than it's capable of doing. 
Um, the pneumonia, you can have pneumonia without congestive heart failure. You can have congestive heart failure without pneumonia. And they sometimes will go together in people who have uh, some weakening of the heart muscle function or are somewhat marginal to begin with. And then the pneumonia tips the scales, okay? And when the pneumonia is treated and the congestive heart failure is treated, if the pneumonia, once the pneumonia goes away, is well treated, the congestive heart failure, the CHF will likewise stay well compensated. So they can come together. Dr. Hazen, for a younger person, middle-aged guy, 47 years old, what are some things I can do at this age that would help me avoid congestive heart failure down the road? The question is, what can you do to avoid congestive heart failure? It's always good to have a plant in the audience, isn't it? Yeah. Um, when, what, uh, what we're getting at here is that it's important to lead a heart-healthy life, lifestyle, meaning appropriate weight. If you have high blood pressure, make sure that the blood pressure is kept under control. If you have sugar diabetes, keep diabetes under control. Because if diabetes and hypertension are not well controlled, that can lead to heart artery disease. If you're a smoker, stop smoking, because that can lead to heart artery disease, as well as other problems, such as emphysema and lung cancer. Um, exercise to help maintain appropriate weight and to help improve aerobic conditioning. Um, so eat healthy, exercise, appropriate sleep. Um, and those are all things that can help prevent congestive heart failure. And the congestive heart failure instances I'm thinking about are predominantly heart artery based. Um, as far as the heart valves go, there's nothing you can really do to prevent a heart valve from deteriorating when you're 70. Um, if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Yes, ma'am. That's just what I was going to ask you. Uh, explain something, a little something about the valve. What causes you to have valve problems? The question is what causes you to have valve problems? Um, is, that, is that heredity? Is that... Um, in some... In, okay, the question is what causes valve problems? Is it hereditary? Um, in some instances, the, there can be, the valve can be formed improperly uh, from when you were a baby. Um, what I'm thinking of predominantly now is called bicuspid aortic valve, where the valve has two leaflets instead of three. Typically, when the aortic valve deteriorates, people are in their <coughs> mid to late 70s, 80s, when it starts to either leak or become narrowed. When you have a, and that's a three leaflet valve. When you have a bicuspid valve or a two leaflet aortic valve, it oftentimes uh, doesn't function as well as it should when people get to be in their 50s and 60s and maybe early 70s because the valve just doesn't um, allow the blood flow to through, through it as easily as, it, as a three leaflet would. Um, the most common reason for heart valve malfunction is just wear and tear. But there can be other things such as an infection on the heart valve or a heart attack can lead to dilation of the heart uh, chamber which then makes the valve not work as well. If you think about it, the valve leaflets, when the valve opens, it, it slams shut. If the heart is dilated, it's like the frame of the door is too big. So when you try to close the door, it doesn't fit into the frame properly. So blood can leak around it. So one of the repairs, remember I mentioned valve repair numerous times. One of the things that the surgeons will do is they'll put a ring around the heart valve and instead of it being this big around, it shrunk to this big around so the leaflets can meet each other instead of being stretched and not, not meeting each other. Um, the most common reasons for the heart, heart valves to fa fail is just pro progress maturity. <laughs> oh, does, the, uh, does the mitral valve and the aortic valve, which one would be the most dangerous to, if you didn't have it replaced? The question is, mitral or aortic valve abnormalities, which is more important to replace? There isn't one that's more important than the other. If, if, if it's not functioning properly, it's, it can cause, they each can cause uh, uh, problems in their own set of problems, whether it be leaky valve or a narrowed valve called stenotic valve. Um, the one exception to that is aortic valve uh, leakiness, or it's called aortic regurgitation, 
that is a valve problem that's very well tolerated for a long period of time um, by, because just the way the heart works. Um, but narrowing of the aortic valve, leakiness of the mitral valve or narrowing of the mitral valve, all those can lead to fluid back up and inefficient heart pump. And it's hard to quantitate which is more important if it's not working properly, depending on the degree that it's not working properly, will have the amount of effect on the heart's function. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I came in late, you might have missed it. Uh, how, how sudden does this come on? Weeks, or take weeks, or months, or years to, to develop? The question is how quickly can the symptoms arrive, and, or, or come on? Um, and you didn't miss it, I didn't say that. Um, it, it can be, it, it can be either. Um, many times people are, can be just um, hovering close to congestive heart failure, but not symptomatic with it, and then it just takes a little bit to push them over the edge, so it seems like the symptoms come on quickly, but it's because they don't have the reserves to tolerate, and that goes along with your, your friend's question about the pneumonia. <laughs> Um, many times the symptoms can come on over time because there's a gradual buildup of fluid. And that's what I was talking about with the weight gain, where you see the, you know, go up a couple pounds this day and a day or two later, a few, few pounds. And, and oh, well, I'm a little short of breath when I'm walking up the stairs, but I've always been doing okay. And a few days later and a few pounds later, it's, no, I'm kind of short of breath when I'm sitting down reading the newspaper. Um, so it, it depends on the cause. Um, if the cause of congestive heart failure is due to a heart attack, because the heart pump, which is pumping normally, now is pumping at half its efficiency because you have a sudden loss of heart muscle, then that would be a sudden onset. So again, it's very difficult to say, okay, this is the way it is for sure every time. It depends on the underlying reasons. And how do you diagnose that? By examining, talking to the patient, examining the patient, getting chest x-rays. There's certain blood tests that suggest to us if there's congestive heart failure. That's what we go to school for. Yes, ma'am. Okay, they've been going through chemotherapy and then signed in the sheet that it could affect my heart back in 1990, which I went through everything at Duke Hospital, having my surgery, and then returning back here for chemo for the six months. Uh, would I be, what would have been saved by now? If the damage was done to my heart through the chemotherapy, what would have been? Uh, still yet, maybe, could it be even now to have symptoms? I'm not sure I understand after your question. That, you, the time. question is that you've had chemotherapy for, <coughs> was, did you say, Six for breast? For cancer. For, for cancer, but that was in 1990? 1990. If, if chemotherapy is going to cause problems with weakening of the heart muscle, it usually occurs around the time or shortly after the chemotherapy is given. So if you've been through that course in 1990, and here it is 20 years later, um, I would not think that if they found that you had weakening of the heart muscle, it would be related to medicine that you received 20 years ago. Next question. Yes, ma'am. With mitral valve prolapse, should it be treated or only if it's producing symptoms? Mitral valve prolapse, well, you guys are, you guys are getting me good. Um, <laughs> mitral valve prolapse is a whole spectrum. You ready for a puppet show? Mr. Ed Cameron back there is going to love this. All right. <coughs> the heart has two sets of heart valves, or two sets of heart chambers, top and bottom. The mitral valve is between the top and the bottom chamber on the left side. So the top chamber is up here, the bottom chamber is down here. When the blood flows, the valve opens up and the blood flows from the top chamber to the bottom chamber. When the bottom chamber contracts, the valve snaps shut so that the blood is, stops, does, does not go into the top chamber, and goes out the aorta to the rest of the body. When you have mitral valve prolapse, the valve bows. And that's not that big a deal. Now if it bows enough, then it can allow a leak. See how my fingers aren't meeting? Mitral valve prolapse is a whole range. It could be from just a little bit of bowing to bowing so much that there's a whole bunch of blood going the wrong way. That's called mitral regurgitation that may require a valve surgery. So when you say, should mitral valve prolapse be treated? It depends on really the function of the valve and how the, how the valve is working. To give you an idea how often, how common this is, one out of six women between the ages of 16 and 36 have mitral valve prolapse. So that's about 16, 17%. My wife has mitral valve prolapse. I married her anyway. 
<laughs> so it's a very common thing. It doesn't really bother cardiologists all that much until it starts blowing enough that it allows leakage. And then it depends on how much the leakage. Certain, when the leakage is mild and the moderate, we can oftentimes temporize things or control the situation with medicines and help people feel well. Um, if it gets severe, then you need to start thinking about whether or not you need to do something else. Yes, ma'am. Um, with atrial fibrillation, is that going to cause congestive heart failure or does the congestive heart failure cause atrial fibrillation? The question is, does atrial fibrillation cause congestive heart failure or does congestive heart failure cause atrial fibrillation? And the answer is yes. Okay. She's like my husband. He does that to me all the time. <laughs> um, the two oftentimes go hand in hand. When you develop, if, if a person develops atrial fibrillation, that does decrease the efficiency of the heart pump a little bit, 15, 20%. So sometimes people may develop congestive heart failure because they've developed atrial fibrillation. Because, because the heart pump... What? Atrial fibrillation. Atrial. I thought you were saying age. Atrial fibrillation. Atrial. Okay. It's my northern accent. Okay. Um, so because the heart pump is a little bit less efficient, fluid can build up. However, if you have congestive heart failure due to weakening of the heart muscle, the heart, as you saw in that x-ray, remember the heart can dilate. Well, if the heart dilates and the top chamber of the heart gets larger, that can predispose the heart to, to developing atrial fibrillation. So one can beget the other and the other can beget the one. So they, there's not only, it's not a one-way street. It's a good question. I can't believe the question. Okay, yes sir. This is your second one, by the way. <laughs> How many? No, 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 it's not a V8. We're a, we're, 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 you want to know how many chambers there are in the heart. Um, the heart has two sets of chambers, top and bottom. The top chambers are called atria, the bottom chambers are called ventricles. So there's a right atrium and a right ventricle, a left atrium and a left ventricle. So there's four chambers, and there are also four valves. Now, those four chambers, they do the same thing? Um, the, the, the right, the right chamber, the right atrium and the right ventricle pump blood. They receive blood from the body and pump it to the lungs. The left atrium and the left ventricle receive the blood from the lungs and pump it out to the body. So it's, it's two closed circuits, like a figure of eight. Right atrium, right ventricle, lungs. Left atrium, left ventricle, body. Right atrium, right, you know, from body to the right atrium and right ventricle, okay? And they usually do not mix. That's a question. The question is, how often should you have your heart checked after a certain age? Um, I would suggest that when you see your family physician, that the heart and lungs be listened to whenever you go to visit, and uh, that will give some insight uh, to the physician as to if there's a problem. And certainly, if you have symptoms such as chest discomfort, shortness of breath, uh, difficulty breathing when you lay down, swelling in the ankles, those are issues that need to be brought up. Um, there are many different ways we have to check the heart, whether that be with an EKG or a stress test or a chest x-ray or an echo, which is, I think I mentioned that earlier, it's a probe the size of my thumb. You put it on the chest and look at the heart with sound waves. Um, your physician can de determine how often and when those should be employed, and a lot of that's based upon what you have said your symptoms are to your physician and what they see when they examine you. Uh oh, another planted question. I, it's really not a planned question, but, but just just a, in case people don't know about Sanger and about this group that you're a part of, can you tell the people just the very broad strokes of what Sanger is and, and the kinds of quality positions you guys have? Because it's pretty amazing. Um, I, I, we're getting off the top to the congestive heart failure. Oh, sorry, I guess you're not there. That's okay. That's fine. <laughs> um, and so I've been asked to discuss Sanger, the Sanger Clinic. It's Actually, the name is Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute, so you may see SHVI, and that's why I bring that up. Um, it's a group of about 90 or so cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, and vascular surgeons that all work together. They're based in Charlotte, 
out of CMC, Carolina Medical Center, but they also have outreach clinics, such as here in Morganton. And here, we have Dr. Anthony Bracken, Dr. Fernando De La Serna, and now me, I'm the, I'm the new, new kid on the block. Even though I've been doing cardiology for 25 years, I've only been here for two to three months. Um, the quality of the care that is available to you in this town is, is absolutely outstanding. Um, I trained at the Cleveland Clinic, and then when I was practicing in Fort Wayne, Indiana for 20 years, the practice I was in was identical, or basically what takes place in Charlotte. So we were the ones that all the surrounding communities would send patients to if they had complicated issues or more sophisticated um, care needed to be employed than what the, the clinics could provide. Well, doctors Bracken and Del Cerna and I have all worked in situations that are like Charlotte. So we've done the sophisticated stuff. We've been to the big city. And there's a lot of what in the past has been sent from Morganton to Charlotte or to Asheville that can be done here because we've done it. I mean, I, 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 these are, I've taken care of complicated and, uh, cases for, for 20, 25 years, and I'm very happy to do it in this type of community. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was in Fort Wayne, I covered a clinic in Van Wert, Ohio, which is a city about two-thirds the size of Morganton, so I would go out there once or twice a week, and we would send people back to Fort Wayne. So I was very familiar and comfortable with practicing medicine in a community this size, and I liked the ability to bring uh, top-notch and sophisticated cardiology care to a city this size. And it's not just cardiology. I'd just like to put in a plug for some of my, my physician colleagues, some of whom I know and some of whom I don't know very well yet but the quality of the medical care here in Morganton is surprisingly sophisticated and good for a city its size, and I think a lot of that is due to um, how beautiful the area is and how nice the people are, and it's drawn in people that, physicians that have worked in uh, the busier, high-paced, high-pressure places that you read about, such as Duke, somebody mentioned Duke, you did. Um, so we, a lot of the care that is available and those type of settings is available here now, but I think with a lot more of a, a friendly and down-home type of uh, atmosphere, which I think is kind of exciting, personally. Don't leave down valleys. <laughs> when I say Morganton, I consider that, I consider it. Uh, when I, okay. We're not Morganton. Blue, blue. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I didn't see that brick wall when I was driving down 40. And, so. Burkamp. See, I got somebody else here on my side. Yeah, I see. And he's my plant, too. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to invite my wife up here, and we'll try to call a few names out. Thank you.